Alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah. He is the most majestic, honorable, and exalted. He deserves the greatest of praise and gratitude. The blessings of our Lord are innumerable and we would never be able to repay Him for them. He made raising children properly an obligation which His obedient servants must fulfill. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner. He made wealth and progeny among the beautiful things of this life as well as means to righteous deeds for which a person would be rewarded after he passes away. I further bear witness that Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and chosen messenger. He was the best parent who ever walked upon this earth and the best father who was filled with feelings of care. O oh Allah sends salah, salam and blessings upon him as well as upon his daughters, sons, wives, companions and all who follow their path until the day of recompense. My dear audience, observing taqwa is the best counsel that can be given and the most virtuous quality we can inculcate. It is the counsel given by prophets, the adornment of the righteous and the provision necessary for the day when we must meet Allah. He said, we most certainly commanded the people of the scriptures prior to you as well as you yourselves to observe taqwa of Allah. People of Iman, observe taqwa of Allah. Every soul must look at what it has prepared for tomorrow. Observe taqwa of Allah as he is completely acquainted with all that you do. The true Muslim is someone who has Iman in Allah, organizes his life in compliance with Allah's commands and prohibitions, and remains certain that Allah brought him into being and that he will eventually return to Allah. Dear Muslims, your children are a trust which Allah has given you. Servants of Allah, your children are a trust which Allah has given you. He has entrusted them to you and giving them proper care and upbringing are among the greatest means of reward in both this world and the hereafter. Thus, any perceptive individual should give that responsibility priority over all matters of this world since fulfilling those duties is, in fact, among the matters related to the hereafter. Raising someone means molding him into a proper human being. That involves imparting knowledge and values, instilling sound perspectives, and refining conduct. It is a process which contains all the efforts necessary to impact a person's makeup. The process of raising someone covers all aspects of his personality and it is to be done with the aim of producing an individual who is soundly balanced. He worships Allah, lives productively in this world, and prepares for the hereafter. Proper raising and upbringing build the morals of the young in order for them to be part of a righteous collective and society. Nations allocate budgets, formulate plans, and implement policies with the aim of educating and raising people to be a certain way. This upbringing also has major effects because it is, in essence, the shaping of individuals. Proper raising and upbringing build the morals of the young in order for them to be part of a righteous society. Proper upbringing also promotes virtues within the young so that they are protected from all that is reprehensible. A righteous child brings happiness to his parents. Among the prayers said by the righteous is, Our Lord, make our spouses and children sources of happiness for us. When a righteous child is present, you feel happy. When out of your presence, you trust him. He prays for you during your life and after you pass away. And he is one of your deeds, regardless of how righteous or not he might be. A righteous child is a source of continuous reward. The Prophet ﷺ told us that when a person passes away, all his deeds come to an end except for three. And among them he mentioned a righteous child who prays for him. This is collected by Muslim. A Muslim is to raise his child properly in order to fulfill the obligation which Allah has entrusted to him. Allah said, people of Iman, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. Additionally, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, each of you has responsibilities and each of you will be asked about what is under his care. The leader and authority has responsibilities and will be asked about what is under his care. A man is responsible for his family and will be asked about what is under his care. 
a woman is responsible for the home of her husband and will be asked about what is under her care. This was collected by Bukhari and Muslim. What will your answer be when you are asked about your responsibilities? Did you fulfill them or neglect them? When you see people behave in a deviant manner, reject sound values, and do wrong things in general, you wonder who trained them to be that way and who or what produced such individuals. Those things result from improper upbringing and in fact neglecting proper upbringing altogether. A generation that lacks sound ethics, proper conduct, firm principles, and a clear objective cannot raise or defend its own people. On the contrary, they would be a liability to their society and a burden upon it. Thus, it is necessary to take a serious look at ourselves, our sons, and our daughters, and to confront the evils which target the coming generation and aim to erase people's morals. In Sahih Muslim, there's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, If any servant given a responsibility by Allah passes away while neglecting what has been placed under his care, Allah will bar him from entering Jannah. Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, commented that there are many guardians who cause their own dear children to be miserable in this life and the hereafter due to neglecting them, failing to raise them properly, and not assisting them in fighting their disobedient inclinations. The guardian may claim he has honored the child when in reality he disgraced him. And he may claim to have been merciful when in reality he oppressed the child. Thus, he would not attain benefit from his child and he would also deprive his child of goodness in both this world and the hereafter. If you were to examine the causes of children being ruined, you would find most of that involving the guardians. We must realize that upbringing does not mean merely providing food, clothing, and shelter. Allah said, it is we who provide for you and for them. Proper upbringing means raising children to have sound beliefs and perform righteous deeds. Dear Muslims, fulfill Allah's directives in caring for those entrusted to you. Reassess your priorities and perspectives. Ask yourself, have you indeed offered your children a righteous upbringing? Have you made that a goal and taken steps to achieve it? A righteous upbringing is one which imparts an Islamic identity and a sense of affiliation to what is correct. That protects a child when he is faced with various ideological challenges. It makes him more aware of and able to resist various forms of deviance which aim to make him doubt the firm foundations of his religion and forsake proper morals as he lives in his Muslim society. The aforementioned is the upbringing which protects a generation from melting away in such a manner that it becomes nothing more than a statistic that is counted. In every individual, ideas and conduct are two components which can be influenced and shaped. When a person is young, those components are sensitive and easily influenced. Thus, they accept training which makes them diligent and decisive such that they prepare the individual to proceed through life with righteousness, steadfastness, balance, readiness to handle matters, and ability to face changes and inconsistencies. The most pivotal stage of development at which that impact can be made is the formative one. And that is the stage when children are still in school. It is a phase of strong emotion, little knowledge, and lack of experience. The initial years of a person's life are the ones in which most of his development takes place. And they are also the years of his life in which he is weakest. Thus, when a child is surrounded with care and positive influences, he will grow up successful, productive, and able to give. Servants of Allah, the beginning of the path to having righteous children is constantly praying to Allah for them. Making dua for our children is something we find in the Quran, the Sunnah of Allah's beloved Prophet, and the practice of the righteous. The most crucial foundation for raising children properly is providing a sound righteous example, and this comes from both parents. Furthermore, children must also be made to feel an attachment to righteous role models found in the companions and the salaf. Children are to be trained to have righteous company, whether that be with those whom they deal with in person or via any other channels. Especially in this era when it has become ever so simple to communicate with others via electronic means. All those forms of company have an influence. Furthermore, modern communication devices have found their way into every household and remaining protected from their harms is quite difficult unless Allah makes that feasible for a person. Those devices are just like one's company. They can be either good or bad. Thus, it is necessary to give this matter adequate attention and not leave it neglected. 
It is also imperative to keep children away from harmful influences and to provide them with monitoring and proper supervision. Many teachers complain about having students whose guardians know nothing about those very children under their care. Rather, the guardians place the responsibility for proper upbringing entirely on the school system and the teachers, while the families of the children remain negligent and the role of the parents is missing from the children's lives. We must realize that the individuals at home are the first ones accountable for children becoming deviant in their ideas or conduct. Educators must raise children to be good people by way of teaching, explaining, and reminding. This develops their moral conscience, which is what inhibits them from doing wrong and encourages them to do what is right. A remarkable statement was reported from Abu Bakr ibn Ayyash rahimahullah, in which he told his son while showing him a room in their home, My beloved young son, do not ever disobey Allah in this room. I completed reciting the Qur'an here 1,000 times. A parent cannot raise his children to be virtuous people unless he himself is a person of virtue, and he cannot train them to be righteous unless he himself is righteous. Children learn by example more than they do by tutelage. Not only that, children have very keen perception when it comes to both flaws and merits, which they see. Thus, when you tell them honesty is good, you have to be honest too. When you tell them perseverance is good, you have to persevere as well. A household should never have a father who is harsh and cruel, or one who is so preoccupied that he knows nothing about his family. Such qualities render him incapable of being a good influence for his children, and the children may even slip from his hands into the hands of others. Dear Muslims, the best of locations are the places where Allah is worshipped, the masajid, and the most conducive of settings for sound upbringing is one in which the Qur'an is taught. Endeavor to make your children accustomed to praying consistently. Cleanse your homes from ills, and draw your children's attention to those things. Proper upbringing is both education and nurturing. When a person becomes accustomed to wrong things, he will accept them, and it will be more difficult for him later on to accept what is right. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu said, remain consistent in training your children to pray, and teach them to be good, because goodness is something that comes with practice. Teach your children to love the sunnah, to emulate people of knowledge and righteousness, to dislike falsehood and wrongdoing, and to ask Allah to guide those who are astray and grant well-being to those who are afflicted. Encourage your children to read and make it something they love to do. Direct them towards what benefits them and steer them away from what harms them just as you would keep them clear of anything poisonous. The best thing any young person can read following the Qur'an is about the life and teachings of Allah's Messenger وسلم, as well as the lives of his companions and the glorious history of Islam. Explain to your children the need the Ummah has for them as individuals and for the light and knowledge which they must carry. Explain to them that they need to put in the hard work required so as to become qualified authorities, scholars, and leaders of guidance and mercy. It is imperative to instill sound understandings within them and repeat those to them. That includes having correct beliefs about Allah on the last day, completely accepting what comes from Allah and His Messenger, adhering to the Sunnah, having love for the Sunnah, knowing the rewards for various deeds, remembering that we will all eventually pass away, preparing for the hereafter, giving concern to the conditions of Muslims, constantly praying for Muslims in general and for Muslim leaders to be righteous, and adhering to the body of Muslims who do what is right. It is also necessary to teach children that they are to respect the elderly and maintain ties of kinship. Children are to be encouraged to excel in their studies and their mistakes are to be corrected gently. Fathers should set an example of showing appreciation for the role which mothers play and mothers should also do the same for the fathers. In this way, the children will grow up in righteousness, faithfulness, love, and compassion. Befriend your children, joke with them, and encourage them. Words of praise captivate minds and hearts. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, When Allah wants good for a household, He places gentleness among them. This is collected by Imam Ahmed in his Musnad. The Messenger وسلم, also said, Whenever gentleness is part of something, it beautifies it. And when it is removed from something, that blemishes it. This is collected by Muslim. May Allah bless us all by the Quran and Sunnah and enable us to really benefit from the ayah and wisdom they contain. I say this much and I ask Allah to forgive me and all of you. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all creation. He is the most merciful, the bestower of mercy, and the owner of day of recompense. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone. He is the true sovereign to whom all worship is to be devoted. 
I further testify that Muhammad is his worshipping servant and his truthful and trustworthy messenger. O oh Allah sends salat salam and blessings upon him as well as upon all his family and companions. Dear Muslims, girls are the more delicate of children and they can be the most loyal. The Prophet said they are the most precious of companions. This is collected by Ahmed. In addition, Amr ibn Adharb told Sasa ibn Muawiyah when he came to ask for his daughter in marriage, Sasa, you have come to me asking to purchase a part of me and to take the most compassionate of my children. Remember that a noble individual is suitable for another noble individual. And a righteous husband is like a father after the real father. Raising girls is an honor for any Muslim and doing so would in fact be emulation of Allah's esteemed messenger وسلم, since he was a father to four daughters whom he raised and gave the best upbringing. Anas anhu, narrated that the messenger of Allah وسلم, said, if someone raises two girls until they become adults, that person will come forth on their resurrection and I will be with him like this. And he put his two fingers together. This was selected by Muslim. The Prophet وسلم, also said, no one has two daughters who reach adulthood and he continues to treat them well for as long as they remain with him or he remains with them, except that the two of them will be a cause for him to enter Jannah. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri narrated the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said if someone has three daughters or sisters or two daughters or sisters and he continues to treat them well and fulfill the responsibilities Allah has entrusted him with towards them, that person will be admitted to Jannah. Jabir radiallahu anhu narrated the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said if someone has three daughters and he raises them, is merciful towards them and cares for them well, he will most certainly be admitted to Jannah. He was asked, Messenger of Allah, what if there are only two? He replied, even if there are only two. Furthermore, some of those present thought that if he was asked about just one, he would have said the same applies to just one as well. This was collected by Imam Ahmed with a Sahih chain of narration. Aisha narrated that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, No one from my ummah cares for three daughters or three sisters and treats them well, except that they will be a cause for him being shielded from the hellfire. This was collected by Bayhaqi and graded Sahih by Albani. In a narration of the same hadith collected by Bukhari in Al-Arab al-Mufrad, the Prophet وسلم, did not specify a number of daughters. He said, If someone has given any number of daughters and he cares for them well, they will be a cause for him being shielded from the hellfire. And Nawawi rahimahullah commented that caring for them refers to providing for them, raising them properly, and other related things. Ibn Baz rahimahullah commented that this shows the virtue of caring for girls and taking care of them well so as to attain the reward of Allah, the Almighty and Most Majestic. Doing that is one of the means of being admitted to Jannah and protected from the hellfire. The same is hoped for someone who cares for others besides daughters as well, such as sisters, aunts, and others like them who are in need. Doing so to attain a reward similar to what the Prophet ﷺ mentioned regarding caring for three daughters. Allah's bounty is limitless and His mercy is infinite. Furthermore, if someone cares for just one or two daughters or others as preceded, the same reward is hoped for in his case as well. In those foregoing hadith, the Prophet ﷺ stressed the rights girls have which their parents and guardians must fulfill in terms of their upbringing. That is because of the weakness they have, in most cases, to care for themselves. It must also be borne in mind that caring for them does not merely mean providing food and clothing. Rather, it also involves being kind, instilling sound morals, and raising them properly overall. I say to all parents, Remember that females are sensitive and delicate and their nature is not suited for roughness or the harsh way that some people deal with their male children. Females are generally raised in a softer way and may not be as effective as others in argumentation. Allah said, do they feel that Allah deserves to have ascribed to him a created being who is brought up in adornments and who in dispute cannot make itself clear? Females are strongly influenced by emotions and they look for safety. And the first place they seek that from is their fathers and mothers. Thus, that must be given to them. Otherwise, they will seek it outside of their home in an environment where they can be deceived by predatory wolves, captivated by words of manipulation, and seized by criminal hands of exploitation. Therefore, you must look out for your girls and surround them with your care. By doing that, you would attain Allah's protection. You must also treat them kindly. And by doing that, you would attain Allah's kindness. 
Prophet ﷺ gave much importance to his daughters and he expressed his love for them. Aisha radiallahu anha said, I never saw anyone whose mannerisms and movements resembled those of the Prophet ﷺ more than Fatima. If she came to him, he would stand, receive her, take her by the hand, kiss her and seat her where he sat. If he went to her, she would stand, receive him, take him by the hand, kiss him and seat him where she sat. This was collected by Abu Dawood and the Tirmidhi. Aisha radiallahu anha also narrated that Fatima once came walking and it was as though she walked exactly the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa walked. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Welcome my daughter. And he had her sit beside him at his right or his left. He then whispered something to her. This is part of a longer hadith collected by Bukhari. Dear parents, you have a major responsibility towards your daughters. There are trusts which has been placed in your hands. There are many times when righteous women produce a righteous generation because of their own righteous upbringing. On the other hand, there are also many times when impious women produce a ruined generation because of their own unsound upbringing. Do your utmost to instill virtue into children's souls and continue to nurture them so that their fruits eventually bear. Make your girls accustomed from a young age to preserving their modesty and chastity. Keeping a young woman's innate sense of shame intact increases her in virtue and does not bring about anything besides goodness. The principles of Islam teach us that a girl should observe hijab when she reaches puberty. In fact, all directives of Islam in general, commands and prohibitions take effect when a person reaches puberty. However, when those directives are imparted prior to reaching that age, it becomes easier to adopt them and comply with them when the time comes. When a person is honest with Allah in terms of fulfilling what has been entrusted to him, Allah will assist him, allow him to meet his objectives, and grant him the happiness of having righteous children. We pray that Allah makes the girls and women of this ummah righteous individuals. And we pray that Allah grants all of us the guidance, mercy, and well-being which only He can provide. In conclusion, invoke salat and salam upon the one whom Allah sent as a mercy to all creation and a guide to all people. O oh Allah, send salat and salam upon your worshiping servant and messenger Muhammad as well as upon his family, companions, wives, children, and all who follow their path until the day of reckoning. O oh Allah, grant strength to Islam and the Muslims, weak in shirk and those engaged in it, and forsake those who oppress people, deny you, and cause corruption. O oh Allah, grant victory to your religion, your book, the sunnah of your prophet, and your believing worshiping servants. O oh Allah, Lord of all creation, bless this ummah with soundly guided leadership, which would contribute to those who obey you being respected, those who disobey you being guided, all things right being enforced, and all things wrong being prevented. O oh Allah, if people endeavor to harm Islam and Muslims, we ask you to busy such people with their own selves and turn their plots back against them. O oh Allah, Lord of all creation, grant victory to those who sincerely struggle in your path, in Palestine and all, place, and all other places. O oh Allah, lift the siege they face, rectify their conditions, and defeat their enemies. O oh Allah, rescue al Masjid al-Aqsa from the aggression and oppression of the occupiers. O oh Allah, we beseech you by your greatest name to grant your care to our Muslim brothers in all places. O oh Allah, grant your care to our brothers in Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Burma, and all other places. O oh Allah, grant them your kindness, alleviate their suffering, and grant them relief soon. O oh Allah, rectify the conditions, unite them upon the truth, protect them from the evil individuals among them, and defeat their enemies. O oh Allah, we implore you to exact retribution from those who are oppressive, as well as all who assist them. O oh Allah, you are perfect in every way, and you are the one who is sufficient for us. O oh Allah, dire circumstances have befallen our brothers in Ghuta. And none can relieve their affliction except you. None can relieve their suffering except you. O oh Allah, we beg you to relieve the suffering of our brothers in Ghuta as well as in Syria in general. O oh Allah, alleviate the affliction which has befallen them. O oh Allah, grant them relief. Grant them your mercy. They are the ones, they have been downtrodden. And we implore you, O oh Allah, to assist them and uplift them. O oh Allah, God, our leader, the custodian of the two sacred mosques, to do all that you love and are pleased with. Lead him so that he fulfills your commands and avoids your prohibitions. O oh Allah, God, him, his deputy, and their aides, to do all that would produce good for your servants and their nations. O oh Allah, assist and grant victory to the soldiers who guard our borders and our troops engage in jihad, struggling in your path as they work to preserve the safety of our lands, families, and sacred sites. O oh Allah, God, all Muslim leaders to govern by your laws and to follow the son of your prophet Muhammad and make them a source of mercy for your believing worshiping servants. 
O oh Allah, spread security and prosperity throughout our nation as well as throughout all Muslim lands and protect us from the evil of those who do wrong and the plots of those who disobey you. Our Lord, grant us good in this world, good in the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the hellfire. Our Lord, forgive our sins and our transgressions and the bounds you set for us. Make our feet firm and grant us victory over the people that deny you. Our Lord, forgive our sins, conceal our faults, facilitate our affairs and allow us to accomplish our aspirations which please you. O oh Allah, forgive us, our parents, our forefathers, their descendants, our spouses, and our children. Indeed, you hear our prayers. O oh Allah, we implore you to forgive all the people of Islam and Iman, men and women alike, whether alive or deceased. O oh Allah, forgive us, none is worthy of worship except you. We implore you to send the rains for us. O oh Allah, forgive us. O oh Allah, forgive us. O oh Allah, forgive us. None is worthy of worship except you, the ever-living, self-sufficient sustainer of all. O oh Allah, you need none, but we are in dire need of you. Send the rains for us and do not make us among those who lose hope. O oh Allah, grant us rainfall. Grant us rainfall that is abundant, encompassing, and beneficial, not harmful. Make it rainfall that revives the earth, provides water for your servants, and allows the lives of people to continue, whether in populated or rural areas. O oh Allah, make it a rainfall of mercy. O oh Allah, make it a rainfall of mercy, not one that brings punishment, trials, destruction, or loss of life. O oh Allah, we beg you to forgive us and to send the rains for us. O oh Allah, do not deprive us of the good that lies with you on account of the wrong which we have done. O oh Allah, we place our full trust in you. You indeed hear and know all things. Our Lord is Almighty, absolved from every imperfection. He grants protection to all his messengers and all praise is due to Allah, Lord of all creation.